partner with us. Now, let's get ready to worship together. Yo, good morning, Spring Creek Online. Listen, it's so exciting to be in the house of God this morning. Right where you are, let's stand, let's worship God together. Team, y'all ready? Yeah. yeah. Y'all ready? Oh, yeah. <laughs> let's have a good time. Come on, John. One drink into the night. One thing a place to hide. This weary soul. This vagabond. Try with all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. 
Listen, believer, be glad today that God's love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out. It's ongoing. So you can rest in his unchanging grace. Worship with us today. Sing it at home with us. See, your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Yeah. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, John. It's higher than the mountains that I face. See, it's stronger than the power of the grave. Constant in the trial and the change. See, there's one thing that remains. Just one thing remains. Everybody, come on. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, it never runs out on me. Yeah. Know that your love never fails and never gives up, it never runs out on me. Come on. Your love. Oh, yeah. Take it out, John. Sing it. Say, oh.
right here, come on. Say, your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. Somebody give God some praise right there. That's your anthem for the week, that God love never fails. Good morning and welcome to Spring Creek Church. I got a really special anniversary today. Uh, on this day, 45 years ago, December 5th, 1976, I preached my very first sermon ever. So I've been doing this for a long time and hopefully have grown and developed in that 45 years. I've had the privilege of speaking in a lot of different contexts on the street. I preached in rescue missions, in rest homes. I've been in conferences and concerts, speaking on behalf of the Lord, and in churches across the U.S. and around the world. But I have to say with all my heart, this is still my favorite place to preach. There's something about being with the same group of people for some 30 plus years that just pushes me to, to get better because I know I can't just bring the same old stuff. I have to continue to dig. I have to continue to gain insight. I have to continue to challenge myself so that I can challenge you. And so I just say from the heart, church, thanks so much for putting up with me for all these years. Well, today we're going to be talking about the angels in this series, This Changes Everything. You know, every year at Christmas, I always have a deep concern for the church that we might somehow leave the manger unclear about what actually happened there, that we would be unmoved by the magnitude of the message and unchanged by what we hear. What I long to see happen is more than just a touch of the Christmas spirit in your life. I want you to feel the way people felt under Nazi occupation during World War II when they finally heard that D-Day had arrived. I want you to experience the birth of hope, to know that Christmas means that the balance of power has shifted, that your liberation is imminent, that a beachhead has been established in enemy-occupied territory, and even though the war may not be over yet, the end is in sight. The prince of this world is about to be cast down because the prince of peace has been born. Because when I say, I wish you a Merry Christmas, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So to begin today's message, what I'd like to do is read to you the account in Luke's gospel of the message of the angels on that very first Christmas morning, beginning in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. You know, when Luke opens his gospel... In all of scriptures prior to the New Testament, there's not been an account of an angel sighting or an angel appearance in 500 years. But in the Christmas story, we literally have this explosion of angels happening. In Luke's account, an angel of the Lord appears to the shepherd in the field and announces the birth of Christ shortly followed by this explosion of an uncountable number of angels that fill the night sky. But even before that, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary to tell her about this miraculous birth that she will endure. And then a, a, an angel appears to Joseph to kind of help him navigate through Mary's pregnancy. Still another angel appears to Zechariah to tell him that his wife Elizabeth is going to give birth to John the Baptist. There are angels all around the Christmas story. In fact, it's the largest concentration of angels anywhere in all of Scripture. 
So where I'd like to begin is with some basic understanding. I call this first point, Angelology 101. Let's begin by answering the question, what are they like? First, angelic beings are mentioned 273 times in Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. What do they do? Well, the Hebrew word for angel is malak, and the Greek word for the New Testament is angelos. Both words mean the same thing. They mean messenger, because angels are messengers. They're messengers of God. They do his bidding. They do whatever God tells them to do, and they're delighted to do it. Some angels are described as having multiple wings covering different parts of their bodies. Others are described as having four-sided heads. Some are described as having glowing bodies of fire, still others with animal-like features. But from all the descriptions we have in Scripture, the Bible makes clear angels are fierce-looking creatures. Angels are often depicted as warriors. They carry swords, engage in battle in the heavenly realms. Evidently, God commands a vast number of angels. We're even told in the Old Testament books, especially in the prophetic writings, that God himself is described as the Lord of hosts or the Lord of the angel armies, which really is referencing the same thing. The Bible also teaches us that angels are created beings with no ability to reproduce which means their numbers have remained constant since the beginning of time. In the beginning, God made an indescribably large number of angels, but exactly how many were never told. But since angels are individually created and they don't reproduce, that means there's no mama angels, there's no daddy angels, and there's no baby angels. There's no indication in the Bible that angels ever age which means that Gabriel, who appeared to Mary to talk to her about her miraculous birth, is the same angel that appeared to Daniel 500 years prior and no doubt looked exactly the same. In addition, because they're a created class of beings, human beings themselves don't transform into angels when we die. You know, there's this popular children's book on angels that says, Heaven is a place where little girls get turned into angels and God does the best he can with little boys. And it's funny, I laugh at it too, but little girls have no greater chance of becoming an angel than little boys do. Human beings just don't become angels. And that leads us to this question, what's their purpose? In other words, why do they exist? What do they do? Now, before we can talk about the role that angels play, I think it's really important for you and I to understand that angels exist to do God's bidding, not our bidding. It's even a part of their name, the word angel, the last part of the name, E-L, that means for God. It's even in many of the personal names of the angel, Michael, Gabriel. In other words, these angels exist for God in his purposes. So what purposes of God do they serve? Well, number one, they exist to proclaim God's message. As I mentioned earlier, the most basic definition of an angel is messenger. Both the Hebrew and the Greek words used to describe these beings both mean messenger. So what's primary about an angel is they provide a messenger service from God to human beings. Next time you're reading the Bible and you come across a story that has an angel reference to it, try substituting the word messenger for angel. And 99 times out of 100, the story is still going to make sense. In fact, in some cases, it'll make better sense. It's important to remember, in the Bible, angels are always one-way messengers, from God to man, and never the other way around. We don't pray to angels. Today, you're going to find numerous books that are written about making contact with your angels, but that has no scriptural support whatsoever. When we pray, we pray to the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. By the way, if you were to succeed in making contact with an angel the way these books advocate, most likely it would be a fallen angel, because a loyal angel of God would refuse that kind of attention and would instead direct you to God himself. Loyal angels would say, don't call us, we'll call you. That's because not only do angels not work for us, they have no interest in changing employers. They work for God alone. A second reason that angels exist is to praise God's glory. 
In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Isaiah gets this vision of God in his throne room, and the angels are flying, soaring about the throne, praising God incessantly. So angels are captivated by worship and never seem to tire of it, which makes you wonder, really, I mean, why have human beings become so fixated on angels rather than upon the one the angels serve? I mean, if we learn anything at all about angels, it's the fact that they're absolutely obsessed with God. They were created to worship and serve him just like we were. So it's very ironic that people today try to distort angels into beings that we worship or have relationships with. No angel whose heart is fixated on God is going to accept that kind of attention. Much like the Holy Spirit, they're content to stay in the background and get our focus completely and totally on the Father. A third reason why angels exist is to encourage God's people. Listen to the writer of Hebrews. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Angels minister to us. That's their duty. Now, some people ask, if I have the Holy Spirit, then why do I need angels? And that's actually a very excellent question. The Holy Spirit and the angels perform different functions. The angels ministry or focus is largely external and physical. In other words, angels really focus on our present circumstances in this world. But the ministry of the Holy Spirit is mainly internal and spiritual. Another way of saying it is angels minister for us and the Holy Spirit ministers in us. So angels will guard our bodies and our pathway. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, he's going to guide us, guard our spirit, and guide us in choosing the right pathway. A fourth reason that angels exist is to pronounce and execute God's judgment. Unlike the angels that you'll see often on Christmas cards and even Valentine's Day cards, God's angels are not all fluff. They're different classes of angels, but one of the most common that's referred to in the Bible is a cherub angel. A cherub is a class of angel mentioned 90 times in the Old Testament. Now, do a little research project for me this afternoon. Go to Google and do an image search for the word cherub. And I promise you, all the images that are going to show up are these chubby, little, naked, Victorian babies. With wings, tiny wings. That's the image you will get time and time again. That image has no correlation to Scripture whatsoever. Cherubim, which is the plural for cherubim, cherubim were created to guard God's holiness. They're kind of like God's secret service agents. It was a cherub that stood with a flaming sword in the Garden of Eden to keep human beings from coming back and partaking and eating of the tree of life. Of course, we don't know exactly what they look like, but naked Valentine babies is probably the furthest thing from the truth. I mean, just consider the fact that Lucifer, the angel who led the rebellion against God, was himself a cherub angel. What I'm telling you is angels are not pushovers. It only took one angel to move the four-ton stone from the entrance to the tomb of Christ. Exodus 14 tells us that one angel stood and held back Pharaoh's army, kept it at bay. In addition, we're told that one angel, the angel of the Lord, destroyed the entire Assyrian army of 185,000 men. To put it in perspective, that's more people than were killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined in World War II. Now imagine, if you will, if that's the power of an angel of the Lord, imagine the power behind an army of angels. A fifth reason that angels exist is to protect God's people. Look at this verse. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Now, there's no question that angels serve as guardians. It could be that each of us from birth is assigned a guardian angel. It might be that we have several angels, and it might be that we have none at all, and God only assigns them when we need them. The Bible's just not definitive on that point other than they serve as guardians. But because angels guard and protect believers, you need to know that Jesus chose to underscore this mission to once again elevate the status of children. Listen to what he said in Matthew 18. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, the children. In heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now to get the full impact of what Jesus is saying here, you need to understand 
that in ancient times, children were considered literally only one rung up from domestic animals. We talked about that in the first message in this series, how that children were really not valued in ancient societies, not in Rome or Greek societies. It was the Jesus movement that was responsible for elevating the status of children. In fact, I made reference to a book by a Norwegian theologian by the name of O.M. Baki, and it's called When Children Became People. Now, this passage I just read to you is yet another example of how Jesus elevates the status of children. Let me explain it. Jesus informed the importance of children by not only saying that children also have guardian angels, but that their angels are among the most important angels of all. Jesus said, their angels always see my father's face. Now, do you understand what he's saying there? Back in those days, kings had lots of servants, most of whom would never meet with the king face to face. Only a privileged few would ever be allowed in the throne room and actually ministering in the presence of the king. What Jesus tells us is that the angels that are given charge over the protection of children constantly stand in the presence of God. That would make the guardian angels of children among the most privileged and highest status angels because they serve in God's throne room. They stand in the presence of God himself. Therefore, they're the most privileged, and they're the most privileged because of the value of that which they protect. Now, there's so much more that I could say about angels in terms of background, but we're just going to bookmark that from now so that we can turn our attention now to the angels' message in the Christmas story. The first thing I would tell you about their message is simply this. Their message gets our eyes off the obstacles There are a few things, I must say, that are more corrosive to the human spirit than fear. Fear will cause us to ignore our values, our hope, and make us even turn our backs on love. Fear allows other people to manipulate us, to delude us, to lie to us. Demagogues will take fear and use it for their own profit and power. Exploiting fear is what allows politicians to manipulate the masses, to drive donations, and to divide our country. Politicians count on fear to translate into more votes for them in the next election. But there's something really toxic about fear, and there's something especially toxic about using fear as a motivator. Because fear does nothing more than overwhelm us, destroys what's precious about us. It makes us give up our hope, It causes us to toss out our values and to live like the people we're not. To quote a president from decades ago when the nation was facing a different sort of crisis, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Still, there's plenty of fear to go around these days, isn't there? It gets amped up even through social media. I mean, how much of our public life today is dominated by fear? And how much do we give into it ourselves? You know, in one of her sermons, Barbara Brown Taylor reflects on what must have happened in heaven when God first told the angels about his plan to come to earth as a baby to save humankind. So Taylor imagines this conversation between the angels of God. Here's what she wrote. Could you at least create yourself as a magical baby with special powers? It wouldn't take much, just the power to become invisible, Uh, maybe the power to hurl bolts of lightning if the need arose. The angels all felt God's idea was a terrible or was a stroke of genius, but it lacked adequate safety features. God thanked the angels for their concern, but said, no, God thought God would just be a regular baby. How else could God gain the trust of his creatures? There was a risk, a high risk, but that was part of what God wanted us to know, that God was willing to risk everything to get close to us in hopes that we might love God again. Now, Taylor makes a really good point that God didn't have to do it this way. He didn't have to become totally helpless and defenseless as a newborn baby. He could have come into this world on a throne with eyes of fire and a lion's roar, but he didn't. God came into this world through Mary's body with Joseph's care, surrounded by animals and hay and shepherds. God came into this world crying at the disruption of birth hungry for his mother's milk, wanting and needing to be held and cradled and soothed. He became vulnerable. He subjected himself to the same limitations and problems and fears that all of us face. This is how God chose to be known to us, 
Because God knew that for us to not be afraid, the Savior had to get down into the messiness of life just the way we live it. So everywhere you turn today, there's a voice trying to make you afraid and keep you afraid. As followers of Christ, we're called, challenged to not be afraid, to fear not. Rather than given to fear, we trust that God is at work in us, through us, and all around us. Now, let me share with you something I learned just this past week about the angel's message of not fearing that really spoke to my life. I was just four years old when it made its debut. I can't tell you I watched it in 1965 when it first came out, but I did watch it every year after I became aware of it. When I was growing up, of course, we didn't have VHS tapes, we didn't have DVDs, we didn't have cable, you didn't have multiple channels. We had a handful of channels, and that was all you could watch. But when you heard that Charlie Brown Christmas was going to be showing on Wednesday night on ABC at 7 p.m., you planned your entire life around that. Basically, I've been watching this show for more than 50 years. When my girls were little, we first had it on VHS tape, then we upgraded to DVDs when those finally came around, and my grandchildren now watch those same DVDs, which means as an adult, I have watched Charlie Brown Christmas exponentially more than even I watched it as a kid. Now, you would think that having watched something for 50 years and pretty much memorized it, that there's nothing new I could learn about it. But just one week ago, I learned something new that blew my socks off. And I really wondered how I could have watched this show for 50 years and never noticed it. I owe this insight to a blogger. His name is Jason Sarosky. He was writing about the movie scene where that Linus stands on the stage all alone and he begins to recite the passage from Luke that I read at the beginning of this message. Linus, when he steps on the stage and he quotes these verses, I wonder if you notice that this happened, because I didn't notice that it happened. Right in the middle of Linus's speech, he drops his blanket. Listen to Sarosky explain. Charlie Brown is best known for his uniquely striped shirt, and Linus is most associated with his ever-present security blanket. Throughout the story of Peanuts, Lucy, Snoopy, Sally, and others will work to no avail to separate Linus from his blanket. And even though his security blanket remains a major source of ridicule for the otherwise mature and thoughtful Linus, he simply refuses to give it up until this moment when he simply drops it. Most telling is the specific moment he drops it when he utters the words, fear not. Now, when I read that, I instantly went to YouTube to find that clip to see if that was true, because I thought, surely I would have noticed that. And it was there, just like he described. When Linus steps out on the stage and he begins to recite in all seriousness the story from the Gospel of Luke, and he comes to the line, fear not, with his hand to his side, it opens up and you see his blanket fall. Now it's a shot from the waist up, so you don't really notice other than his hand opening up. And at the end, when it pans just to him alone, there's his blanket on the floor and his hands are free and his face lights up the moment that he drops that blanket. Listen to Sarosky explain. He said, looking at it now, it's pretty clear what Charles Schultz was saying through this, through this, and it's so simple, it's brilliant. The birth of Jesus separates us from our fears. The birth of Jesus allows us to drop the false security we've been grasping so tightly and learn to trust and cling to God himself. So in the midst of all the fear, the insecurity, the uncertainty about what the future holds, a cartoon image from 1965 is a powerful reminder of where our true security and peace lies. It's found in the place where it's always been, where it can always be found. It's in the message of the angels about the Christ who was born in the city of David, a savior, one who would rescue us from our fear. And it makes me just wonder, What's your blanket? What do you cling to instead of the promises of God? Where do you run when you feel alone, anxious, small, and afraid? The angels are saying, it's time to drop the blanket. It's time to stop numbing ourselves. It's time to stop distracting ourselves. It's time to stop sticking our head in the sand and pretending like reality is not happening all around us. What's your blanket? 
What do you cling to instead of the promises of God? But there's something else about this angelic message. And the message is that it reminds us of what God is doing. In Luke 2, we find the lyric to the angel's song. And this is what they sing. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Now, you may not realize it, but it's mainly from the message of the angels. Yes, the angels that we learn about the significance of Jesus' birth. They tell us that Jesus' birth means the arrival of peace on earth. In fact, Jesus' birth announcement is patterned after the same announcement that they would make when a king would ascend to the throne, when a new Caesar was, in, in effect, born into this world. And what God is wanting to make clear is that Jesus' entrance as the new king of this world into this enemy territory in which he's been born is the birth of peace on earth. But you say, wait a minute, that's not right. Earth has never really known peace. In fact, in the past 2,500 years, there have been 900 years of war and 1,600 revolution. That's an average of one per year for hundreds of generations. Peace on earth didn't arrive. And even today, there's still no peace. It reminds me of a true story of a very famous poet that you recognize his name, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Longfellow wrote a Christmas hymn called, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. It's always been one of my favorite Christmas songs. And one of the things that makes it so special is not just the powerful power of the lyrics, but the story behind those lyrics. You see, he wrote it on Christmas Day in 1863. This was the height of the Civil War in the United States. It was anything but a time of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Only six months prior to that was the Battle of Gettysburg. The total number of people who were killed, missing in action, or wounded was nearly a third of all the soldiers who participated in that campaign. The loss of life was catastrophic. Even as the nation, though, was tearing itself apart, it couldn't even compare to what was going on tearing apart the insides of Longfellow. You see, in December of 1863, Longfellow was still grieving the death of his wife from two years prior. His wife, Frances, had been trying to preserve some of their seven-year-old daughter's hair trimmings. So she took the little curls and she'd placed them in an envelope and was trying to seal them with wax. So she had a candle in one hand and a bar of wax in the other. And all of a sudden it fell into her lap. It ignited her dress and she went up in flames. She ran immediately. She was in the room with the children. She ran immediately to Longfellow's study, to Henry's study. And when she comes in the room, the first thing that he does is he grabs a rug and he envelops his wife and tries to put out the fire. That didn't work. So he throws the rug aside and he grabs her with his arm and tries to smother the flames with his own body in the process, burning his arms, his hand, and his face terribly. She died of her injuries the next morning at the age of 43. Henry was so severely burned that it kept him from attending his own wife's funeral. In fact, the burns on his face were so extensive that it made it extremely difficult for him to shave anymore, which is why he grew out the iconic beard that he became famous for. Later, Longfellow would write in his personal journal, I have no heart for anything. There's only one thought in my mind. You know what that is? How joyless, hopeless, and aimless life has become. As Christmas Day approached that year, Henry wrote, a, a Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is no more for me. To make matters worse, only two weeks prior to Christmas in 1863, his son Charlie, a Union soldier, had been shot by a Confederate in action. And, and he, as he lay in this hospital, it wasn't for certain whether he would live or die. Now, he did recover from his wounds, but you've got to remember, in those days... Many people suffered and died, not just because of wounds, but often even the medical procedures used to treat those wounds or the infections that followed in, the, in light of those wounds. So the war had gotten very personal for Longfellow, which meant on Christmas Day in 1863, as the church bells are ringing the songs of Christmas, Longfellow was struggling. The message of peace on earth contradicted his own reality. So this is what he wrote. 
I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and mild and sweet their songs repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. I can feel his pain. I can identify with his pain, can't you? Even now, hate is strong, and it mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. So singing about peace and joy and happiness at Christmas only seems to deepen our sense of disillusionment with the message itself. How can there be peace when we're surrounded by so much hate? How can we speak of peace with a nation so divided and rhetoric has become so toxic? That's where Longfellow was in his heart and in his head. But in the midst of that despair, something happened that he didn't count on. The more he listened to the Christmas bells, the more he thought about the message of Christmas, the pain in his heart began to give way to hope. His hurting heart was met by God's healing love. So he wrote these words, then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, good mil goodwill toward men. To me, this song captures the essence of Christmas. I mean, in a world that tends to wring every ounce of hope out of us, God's message at Christmas is what is wrong and bad and evil in this world does not get the last word because this is God's world. He's not dead. He's not asleep. The, the wrong will ultimately fail. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it will eventually utterly and completely fail because this is God's world and God is good and his last word will be good. So it's God, not cancer or COVID or heart attacks that's going to get the last word. It's God, not violence or racism or hatred that will have the last word. It's God, not poverty, injustice or oppression that's going to have the last word. It's God, not fear, anxiety, or despair that will have the last word. This is God's world, and God gets to have the final say. Christmas is unrelenting hope for the hopeless. It's proof of a message that a good God rules the universe, and ultimately his way, his plan, his purposes will prevail. Jesus Christ is the down payment on that promise. This is the message of Christmas. Jesus has changed the balance of power. His plan to transform the world begins in your heart and mind, where his peace is manifesting is in the hearts and lives of his people. So D-Day arrived in that manger in the tiny town of Bethlehem, and the world will never be the same. But there's one more thing I have to remind you of, and that is what we learn from what the angels cannot say. You know, the angels, because they have existed longer than humans, they have been witnesses to everything that God has been doing since the beginning of time. In fact, in some of the ancient Jewish writings, angels are called watchers because that's what they've been doing. They've been watching the drama of redemption unfold. They've been looking intently into what God is doing and bringing his message for thousands of years to human beings. And remember, the angels were there at the birth of our first parents, Adam and Eve. They were also there when they rebelled and fell. In fact, it was one of their very own, a cherub angel named Lucifer, who led the rebellion against God. He took the form of a serpent. He, he, he tempted the first couple into sin, and it brought down judgment on the entire human race. So for all times, they've been watching and looking to see what God would do to deliver us from the enemy of this world. The angels have been watching this drama unfold from the first promises. They've, they've seen when it's become precariously close to not happening at all. They've seen the times the enemy has tried to disrupt the plans of God. They've been enthralled in what God is doing. In fact, the Bible reminds us, do you realize how fortunate you are? Angels would have given anything to be in on this. So even though they've been fascinating watching this drama unfold over the thousands of years, there is still something they can't say. There's something they can't say that you and I can say. And what they can't say that we can is we can call God our Father, and they can't do that. It's a special privilege to experience family with the Father, 
Because God's plan of redemption ultimately is that we would become one with him, that we would become family with him. The angels themselves will never experience that. But it doesn't prevent them from entering into our joy that we get to. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. The angels' joy, their joy and their party that that erupts in heaven every time someone comes to embrace this wonderful plan of redemption that God has is a joy that they themselves can't experience. But do you know why they have so much joy? Because they see the joy in the heart of the Father that the one who was lost is now found. The one who was perishing is now alive. The one who was hopeless is now full of hope. They rejoice because it brings the Father so much joy. Which leads me to another question. It's a speculative question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And that is if an angel were to make himself known to you today and had something to say, something to ask, What might that angel have to say? To me, seeing what we've seen, experiencing what we've experienced, I think I know. I think he would ask, why are you not more captivated and enthralled by the gospel? Why doesn't the single greatest rescue mission in the history of the universe captivate you and cause you to worship unceasingly like we do? Why doesn't Christmas make your heart soar? How could this news not melt your heart over and over again, regardless of how many times you've heard it? So let me say once more what I said at the beginning of the message. Every year at Christmas, my deepest concern for the church is that we might somehow leave the manger unclear about what happened here, unmoved by its magnitude and unchanged by its message. I want so much more for you than just a touch of the Christmas spirit. I want you to experience what the people did who were living under Nazi occupation when they first heard the news that D-Day has arrived. I want you to know that Christmas means the balance of power has shifted. Your liberation moment is at hand. Hope is reborn. A beachhead has been established in enemy enemy occupied territory. The war may not be over yet, but the end is in sight. The prince of this world is to be cast down because the prince of peace has arrived. You can drop your blanket now because that's what I mean when I say to you, Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Father, I come to you just so grateful for the message of the angels that in this moment in time, this Really, this, this, this watershed moment through which all history is divided, when Jesus Christ enters the world, the Prince of Peace is born. We have this explosion of angels all around this story. And the message of the angels is quite clear, that the birth of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace has changed everything. The peace has arrived, maybe not in this world yet in terms of to infect and affect every single life, but it's going to touch and it's going to begin that revolution in individual hearts like it's begun in mine, like it's begun in those who are true followers of Jesus. The peace revolution has already started and it just needs to spread. And for so many of us, Lord, that even though we're the children of God, we cling, we cling to things that we think we're going to bring us comfort, will give us relief from our anxiety. And sometimes maybe it's stuff that's not even good for us. Maybe it's just a distraction. Maybe it is we're, we're running in all these directions because we're not hearing the message of the angels. Jesus' arrival in this world means it's the end of fear. It's time to quit fear and it's time to drop the blanket. It's time to trust in him. And Lord, most of all, I pray that in this moment, if there, there are people here that just every Christmas, they just kind of check out thinking, well, I've heard this story and I've heard it a hundred times, that we would have the perspective of the angels who never get tired of hearing about the greatest rescue mission in the history of the universe, that this story, that this reality come into this very broken world shifted everything permanently, that they see that, they know that, they understand that, and they praise that incessantly. They're so excited about it that they get excited and have a party. They rejoice when we come to be a part of that plan ourselves. 
So God, help us to share the angel's perspective. Help us to have a, a deeper, more profound appreciation for what happens at Christmas, especially that we get something the angels never received, and that is the privilege of calling God our Heavenly Father. So Lord, if there's anyone here who for whatever reason has never understood until this moment that Jesus is the arrival of God into this world, that he came to share the brokenness, the messiness of life, so that we would learn not to fear but to trust in him, that they would take a moment of trust right now and say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I didn't understand it until this point in time, but if you did that for me, I want you to forgive me. I want you to live in me. I want you to set me free. I want to live for you from now on. God, as best I know how, I'm giving my life to you. And, I, and I'm saying, I want to learn more, and I want to lean to this, and I want to learn what it means to be a true and fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, do in through and for me what I cannot do for myself. Change the way I think, change the way I feel, change the way I behave. Do that in me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, we are so happy when you choose to join us online. Please, if this message has spoken to you in any way, not only like it on social media, but share it. Share it with someone who maybe is just kind of going through the motions today. Maybe, maybe they've forgotten. Maybe they no longer appreciate what Christmas really is. And today, through the message of the angels, they can hear that message once again and have hope reborn in their heart. Please do that for us. If you have a need, a prayer request, if you made a decision as a result of the service, we'd always love to know about that. Please let us know through the comments. You can always uh, text us or you can uh, send us an email to let us know how we can pray for you, how we can serve you, how we might better know how to connect you to the body that's at Spring Creek here. God bless you and have a very Merry Christmas.